Thank you all for coming out here today. Uh, we had a lot of competition with this beautiful day. It must have been uh, very tempting to go and go on the trails or sit along the beach somewhere. My, uh, my dad used to say to me, think before you speak. And so there's been a few people who have asked me, like, so do you know what you're going to talk about today? And I would say, well, no, I, I really have no idea. And that's not exactly true, but I wonder what my early childhood would have been like if my father had said, feel before you think. And that really takes me into the story of who we are by virtue of who we have always been. When we look at the long trajectory of humanity, who are we? Isn't that the big question? There's, uh, there was this gag gift that I saw at one point. It was like coming up on Christmas, so all of the gag gifts are out. And it was, uh, it was called the Handy Woman's Toolkit. And inside was a butter knife and a high-heeled shoe. Because, you know, if you're a woman, you've, those are your tools. You've got your screwdriver, you've got something to pry with, you've got something to hammer with. Those are the things that are handy and accessible. And, uh, and although those, those will work, you can certainly hammer a little nail into a wall and hang a picture there. It's not what they're designed for. That was not their intended purpose. And I think that's a good description of who we are today. Let's look at who we are by virtue of who we have always been. So we came out of the trees roughly seven million years ago. So seven million years ago, we can still look at fossils that, that had this, that had this opposable thumb, which is on their feet that enabled them to climb trees really, really well. But yet there were some changes in the way the skeletal structure was organized to enable that, that being to stand on two legs and to be able to, um, to walk more like we do. So no, we wouldn't say that they were quite human, but they were, they were pretty close. They were getting to be like us. And when we look at seven million years. That's a long time. That's a long time from then to now of being human-like. So we developed a lot of instincts to enable us to do what we do easily and efficiently. We developed instincts which when those instincts are really deeply fulfilled in our lives, we feel relaxed. We feel comfortable we're more likely to feel happy. So what would it have been like in the long history of humanity, even if we don't go back seven million years, let's go back two million years to when we were using stone tools. Let's go back over a million years that we have been... Over a million years, we have been living with fire. So what, was, what were our lives like? And because I do so much work with kids, let's take the life of a child growing up in that kind of an environment. So the first thing is that children mimic the, the adults and the ones that are older than them. We have that as an instinct. We have an instinct to mimic. And growing up in that kind of an environment within your tribe, that's how you learn everything that you need to know so that you can meet your needs easily and efficiently. All you got to do is what everybody else is doing. And that way, you learn the places to make shelter, how to make shelter, how to start a fire, what kind of plants you can eat. You learn how to set snares. You learn how to navigate. You learn all of these things just by mimicking. As you are growing up and you look around at the people in your tribe, those are the folks that you will know your whole life. Sure, there's going to be a few that die. There's going to be a few more that are born. But pretty much, it is what it is. 
there's a book called The Tipping Point, which talks about how many people we can really effectively maintain relationships with. There's a limit. Some of you who have uh, you know, 1,500 people on Facebook, it's like you're not in contact with it. Those aren't friends. Those are friends. And uh, when we look at how many, how many phone numbers can you remember? Well, that's a good way to look at it. How often do you contact these people? So if you remember their phone number because you're in that much of a relationship with that person, and now we're like, wow, how many? Not that many, not that many. So for the long history of humanity, 25 to 50 individuals, that's pretty much, that's the size of a tribe. That's your community. And sure, that community has relationships with other communities, but we're not talking about a lot of people. You don't travel long distances. The extent of your travel, maybe 300 miles <coughs> for most people. You probably never go more than 300 miles from a fixed central point. That's your land base. Beyond your two-legged community, all of the individuals that are in your extended community that make up your environment, the fox people, the deer people, the mouse people, the winged ones, and the one-legged peoples, those are the plants. You get to know all of them intimately. Your life is all about deepening relationships. So you get to know all of those peoples and the land that you live on intimately. And you recognize that as you go through your life, you're continually expanding your understanding of who you are in the context of those finite relationships. You know that everybody in your tribe has your back. Fiercely egalitarian is a way to describe these people. Your people, your ancestors, when you go back far enough. So here's how that plays out. Let's say that I make a spear. So I, I make the spear, I'm gonna take my time because I know that I am in relationship with the wood and if I'm pointing it with a, either a bone point or a stone point, I'm in relationship with all of these elements. I'm in relationship with other beings. I'm taking my energy and I'm putting it forth in my intention of how that spear eventually will be thrust or thrown into the body of another being which will then sustain me and my people. But this is not my spear. This is the spear that I made. Now, if a member of my, my family, my tribe, my community wants to go out hunting and doesn't have a spear, they can go into the hut that I made, which is not my hut, and they can take the spear that I made, which is not my spear, and they can go hunting with it without asking my permission because it was never mine. If they are successful and they throw that spear and it kills an animal, they bring it back and they share it amongst our people. If they're not successful and they throw the spear and it hits a rock and it breaks, dude, that's bad luck. That's all. It's just bad luck. Yeah, you know, that happens sometimes. And that person is not obligated to replace my spear because it was not mine. It was ours. Amongst the Diné tribe, and I used to run a school up in British Columbia, and my business partner was uh, raised by his Diné grandmother. There is no way to say I or me or mine. You can't even say it in that language. The closest that you can come to saying that is this one of. So this one of this tribe feels that we should move in that direction. It is a recognition that who we are as an individual is defined by our relationships. Isn't that interesting when we think about the way the world is today?
so I look at the children that I work with today and I observe how they move. I observe the things that they're interested in. And what's really fascinating is just take a group of kids and put them out in the woods and stand back. Watch what happens. Within no time at all, there are kids who are trying to start a fire. Somebody is sharpening a stick or they found something that's gonna work as a spear and then they're trying to build a, a shelter. So these are our instincts. I contend that in our society, the depression and the distancing and the distraction that is so prevalent, which leads to so much, so much sadness in our society, because of course, antidepressants are the number one most prescribed drug in America today, that it comes largely due to repressed instincts. So yes, you can take a high-heeled shoe and you can use that to pound in a nail into the wall, but that's not its intention. How did we get where we are today when we have these beautiful instincts which enabled us for so many, so many hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of years to be able to meet our needs easily and efficiently. How did we get here? It's been a very fascinating experiment in humanity. Most changes genetically um, can be looked at over a very long period of time, but there's a few that, have, that happen over a very short periods of time, relatively speaking. And one of those is this development of the uh, the frontal cortex of the brain, which allows us to have this extended childhood period where we are absorbing information and we're creating beliefs. And we are taking all of this information around us and we're formulating our beliefs and through those beliefs we're establishing patterns. And that's very useful, that's a totally effective way to move through the environment you know, we're learning ways to um, relate to one another. We're learning beliefs about money. We're learning about where we should go in our life, what we should do with it, that goes way beyond what we ever had available to us simply through our instincts. If we did not have that, then when the sun comes up in the morning, we would stare at it because it'd be like, oh, that's amazing. Because we wouldn't have this pattern, this belief that says, oh yeah, I know that. Oh yeah, the sun's, sun's coming up. I've seen that, done that, been there. Raise your hand if you've ever seen a pigeon. Anybody? So good, you've all seen a pigeon before. What color are their eyes? Sounds like a rainbow. <laughs> um, generally speaking, the, you know, in almost all cases, the pigeons around this area, the, the wild pigeons, are going to have orange or red eyes most of the time. There's a few, little bit of variation there, especially if you get into the designer pigeons. But um, how is it that we know something? And when I asked you to put up your hands, I'm pretty sure that all of you are like, oh yeah, I know pigeons, I've yeah. seen those. Yeah. But we don't know them. And the reason is because it's, that's the way our brain is set up. So scientists say that unconsciously in every second we are aware of approximately two million bits of information. Two million bits of information. And we are consciously aware of only about 127 of those two million. Wow. So we create our own reality and we see what we want to see based upon our beliefs. And how do we function if that's only the little piece, that little sliver of reality is what we're seeing? Well, we function because we have spent a long time in this formative stage where we're developing patterns so that we can just do things unconsciously. So 95 to 97%, so the scientists say, of everything that we do is unconscious. We're not even thinking about it. 
So, you know, if you've driven the same route many times, you can get into your car and then a little while later you're home and you're like, wow, I don't even remember that. <laughs> you know, I just showed up here because I was thinking about something else. And yeah, you just, you allowed your unconsciousness to pilot the car because you've done it enough times. You know that route. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to think about it from a conscious standpoint. You can allow your unconsciousness to simply navigate for you. We do that all the time. Here's the risk. The risk is that we develop beliefs primarily during this very early stage of our lives, up until age six is when we're a human sponge. And some of the beliefs that we take in do not serve us well. We have beliefs about being individuals and how we need to fight and how there's not enough. And so when we are allowing these beliefs to override the long history of how we have made it from seven million years ago to here, then we're actually rolling the dice and taking some big chances because we're trying something new. It's fascinating, it's amazing that humans are organized in that way where we actually have the ability to override our instincts and say, you know what, I'm going to believe something else. I'm going to try this out and see how it works. So, um, as we can see, some, some of those things are not working well. Some of those things are fabulous. I mean, look at the technological innovation that we have today. Wow, amazing. There's so much cool stuff that we can make, that we can do today, that we've never been able to do in the, throughout the history of humanity. But, ooh, blink in the eye of just how long we have been living on this earth. We're just trying it out. You know, if you go back just barely over a hundred years ago, people were starting fires with flint and steel. Matches didn't really come into vogue until right around 1900. Wow. So all of the stuff that we're trying out. Um, you know, I don't actually watch Dr. Phil, but the one thing that I do, that I've taken home from that, that I do love, is he asks this question, how's that working for you? And that's the question that we really need to ask because we all carry these beliefs that we've never challenged. We've never evaluated them. It's like, that's just what was handed to us. We as a child, and children are beautiful in this regard. Children, they look to their adults, especially when they're really little, uh, with, with trust. It's like, you're going to teach me everything I need to know because I understand that that's the way that humans have always been. We teach our children everything that they need to know so that they can grow up and be happy and be connected and, and have the kind of fulfilling lives that we hope for them. And so the kids just trust that. They just take it in. I really feel for kids today. I really do. You know, they recognize that if they go to a, to a typical school, they're not getting the education that they need in order to have their needs met in this world today not just from the standpoint, the most basic one, of when you graduate from school, will you be able to get a job that enables you to pay for your rent and, and your food and those other things, but are you getting the education that will enable you to make connections that feed you, that nourish you deeply? So, the Iroquois League of Nations, they have a government that has been in place now for successfully for about a thousand years. And, uh, and it's fascinating, fascinating the way that it's set up. So only men are allowed to serve in office. However, 
the women are the ones who vote the men into office and can remove any man at any time. <laughs> so there is this understanding of masculine and feminine dynamics which is at work in cultures that have, have lived and remembered a deep relationship. Relationship, I keep coming back to that word. It's about your relationship with the land and your relationships amongst your community. So masculine and feminine dynamics. Of course, right now we have this overabundance of masculine within our society. Now the masculine, it's, and I'm, by the way, I'm not saying male, so don't, don't mistake that because we all have masculine and feminine qualities to us, but as a society, we have an overabundance of masculine energy right now. So masculine is intellectual. It is overly impressed with its own cleverness. It is driven, it's goal-oriented, it is problem-solving, it is seeing things in a step-by-step -step logical manner. How do we reach a perceived desired outcome? It is also very focused on the physical, and it's always desiring change. It is very judgmental. It is divorced from emotion. By contrast, when we look at the feminine, and we look at the long history of humanity, which was matrilineal, so societies are organized around um, the female lineage, we are looking at qualities which are harmony-seeking. It is the energy which flows to fill the vessel without defining the walls of it. It is all about connection. It's all about emotion. It is non-judgmental. It is in the present. And it's also very intuitive. It is from this place, which is a quality of beingness, that we derive right relationship. What I see of the way that the environment called forth a way of being in ancient peoples, pre-agriculturally, is that the environment was calling forth this um, very intuitive way of moving. I think if we, if, we had a, if we had poster children for this, it would probably be, um, it would probably be the Australian Aborigines. 60,000 years out of Africa, first people out of Africa, what did they do? So you think of like, oh yeah, what are the technological advancements that have been brought forth by the Australian Aborigines? They brought us, um, and then there was, um, mm -hmm. I mean, they got that cool thing that goes, you know, they got the didgeridoo, that's cool. And then there you got the boomerang, and, and that's pretty cool, too. Um, but where are there, like, towering achievements when we want to look at change that has been manifested upon our physical reality that generations, hence, can look back and say, yeah, look at that. We don't see much. Not for them. That is a way of living in the present. That is a way of harmony seeking. So blending with the environment rather than, rather than dominating it and altering it and making it bend to your own will. It's a different way of being. So did those people just do nothing? Did they just hang out for 60,000 years? they have a very, very deep understanding of who they are within the context of their relationships. And when the Australian Aborigines are talking to the anthropologists and the anthropologists are like, so like, okay, the, um, the dream time and the song lines, so it's like this, right? It's kind of this way and, and the old people are like, sort of, you know, you're, you're getting it but it's more, it's more. There are some things that from here cannot be translated to here. And if you're in this place and you're trying to understand it, you're always gonna come up short. You will have a distortion. Amazing 
amazing how we are this beautiful and complex organism. Um, so just the way that the environment was set up, just the way that the environment called forth from us a certain way of being, when the tribe was moving through the environment and say they were looking for a new place, looking to establish a new camp, or maybe they were looking for a group of hunters, let's say, and they're like, okay, where are the deer? Now you're always gonna have somebody who's more logical and they'll be like, well, you know, it's, it's, the sun is this high, it's this time in the day, looking at the topography and the lay of the land. Um, deer are probably going to want to be moving up into the oaks, into the shade at this time of the day. I think that we should go, you know, over there. And then there'll be somebody else who is really moving from the intuitive, and they will just say, I feel like the deer are over there. Tribe almost always follows the dude who is like, I feel that the deer are over there. Almost always. Moving into this place of the feminine, which is a place of connection, which is a place of, of channeling intuition, which is a place of determining right relationship. And then from that place, once that right relationship and direction has been determined, we move forward. There's a prophecy amongst the, um, uh, down in Peru, where they talk about the eagle and the condor soaring together. So my, my understanding of that is we're talking about the condor as indigenous wisdom, people who are living very much connected to the earth and in those relationships. And then we have the eagle, which is all about this modern era and all of this amazing technological innovation and those two soaring together. I wonder what our world would look like if we could actually do that. If we could guide modern innovation with an indigenous way of finding right relationship so that everyone wakes up each day with this sense of today, I'm gonna to create more beauty Today, I am going to create more harmony. Today, I am going to extend my relationships to embrace more. I would love to see that happen in this lifetime for our children and for us. Thank you, Chris. My pleasure.